Hi there. My name is Ray Blackstone. Let us suppose that you are going to a little gathering someday soon in the home of a friend. Or perhaps it will be a luncheon or a picnic or a cruise or a vacation in the country. There you will meet people, nice people like yourself. You will wish to mingle freely with these people. You will wish to talk with them easily and smoothly and interestingly. You can do it. This record and the others in this series will show you how to develop the ability to engage in good conversation. Listen to what follows right now, and you will hear conversation that will enrich your vocabulary and stimulate your imagination. You will hear and learn new words, phrases, ideas, anecdotes, quotations in humor, properly pronounced by expert conversationalists. By these easy but skillful examples, this record will help to open up for you new worlds of charm, personality, and thinking that will aid you in your social life, in business, and generally. You, too, soon will be a master of colorful conversation. Of course, one of the most valuable conversational arts is the ability to listen to the other fellow. Never try to monopolize the entire conversation. Do not make it one-sided. Draw in others so that the conversation becomes a pleasant give and take of lively ideas and vibrant personalities. But when you do talk, you will wish to be vivid, reasonably polished, and convincing or witty. Warning, do not try to make your conversation sparkle with too many new, stunning words. It will not be natural. Do not cram too much in. Just drop a few new words here and there into your conversation the way your new friends here on this record do. Try it now, and you will be delighted when your friends sit up and take notice and listen to you admiringly. Now you are ready for the first conversational lesson by our experts in the art of gracious, agreeable, and occasionally humorous conversation. Let us suppose you are at a social gathering in the home of a business associate. The conversation turns to politics, or you may steer the conversation in that direction. Have you seen the news reports? The president said recently that the age of chivalry is not past. In America, we still place the American woman on a pedestal, and justifiably so. Some young man standing at your elbow, let us call him Larry, chimes in, perhaps as follows. Well, that's undeniable, Bob. Everybody loves Whistler's mother and Grandma Moses. And next, a young lady, very alert and charming, let us call her Betty, who completes your conversational trio, adds her opinion as follows. Yes, Mother's Day proves it. It's become an important event in this country. And St. Valentine's Day certainly is a boon to the candy makers and the jewelers. Few men are courageous enough to venture home on Valentine's Day without a gift, or at least a lacy card for their dear better half. The American mother and the American wife are idolized. Now the conversation is off to a good start, rippling along gaily. You come in again as follows. The president is on sound ground, of course, Betty. He is against man-eating tigers, and he is for the American woman and the American home. It is good politics. Nobody dares disagree with him on those points. Mothers, wives, widows, and grandmothers, too, cast a tremendous vote. Well, that's understandable. Public officials must be guided by public opinion, whether in the field of motherhood, foreign trade, street traffic, or the treatment of the American Indian. You know, I suppose that's true, Betty, but so many politicians just hope to fill some job, and if the lightning strikes them, advance up the ladder to a commissionership or judgeship. But in all their speeches and press conferences, don't any of these public figures mean what they say? Of course they do. The American political scene has been filled with men and women of high principles. Yet the best of them frequently find it desirable to practice expediency and conformity. They are confronted with necessity of pleasing the fat cats. They know, as Lincoln intimated, that you can't please all the people all the time, nor can you fool them. They must not antagonize large blocks of voters if they wish to remain in office. Some politicians compromise. They carry water on both shoulders. Yet our political system has worked. It has produced some good men who have guided us forward reasonably well and with a fair degree of prosperity and safety. History bears you out on that, Bob. Jefferson was a politician and a good one. Webster, Clay, and Patrick Henry, 
All were politicians to their fingertips, and they were honest. Even New York's Fiorella LaGuardia was a politician, although he disdained tin box politicians and clubhouse loafers. The days of the backroom politician appear to be on the wane, but political parties in one form or another go on forever. Well, friends, this is Ray Blackstone again. You have just finished listening to your first lesson with Bob, Larry, and Betty, our expert conversational trio. You have learned new words, phrases, and ideas. With a little examination of the conversation manual and playback of the record, you will absorb these words even better, and you will improve your spelling, diction, and usage. You may have noticed that the conversation was not top-heavy with star-spangled words. It was relatively simple, or at least straightforward, but it was garnished frequently enough, like ripe cherries on a walnut sundae with some splendid words to add to your vocabulary. Words that will help increase your command of the language. Words and phrases and ideas that will help you add persuasiveness, charm and personality to your daily conversation. Wherever you may meet people whose attention respect or admiration you may desire. We will hear again the pleasing voices of our new friends, Bob, Larry, and Betty, in a moment or two. In the next lesson, they will talk about social gatherings and parties. I will return to speak to you later. <laughs>